I knew that I couldn't do it anymore. In that moment, I knew I was done. Uh, I knew that uh, there was something better than being exposed to death, doom, and destruction day in and day out. There's a quote. There are three types of people who run into the face of tragedy instead of away from it. Police, fire, and journalists. I don't know. Okay, fine. So that's rolling. Um, that's rolling. Okay, great. And uh, yeah, I can do this. I know how to do this. Just so I have it. How do I look? Here's the first time. <laughs> I will not. I will not do it. I'm not going to do it. I don't want to do this. I don't want to be on camera. I don't want to. I never want to be in front of the camera. I prefer to be behind the lens. But to understand this story, you need to know mine. I wanted to be a, a, a filmmaker. I wanted to make movies. I was going to be George Lucas or Steven Spielberg. Growing up, I always had a video camera in my hands. My first one had the tape deck that goes over your shoulder. I made some high quality videos. Who the hell are you? My journey in journalism began in 2001. A bright eyed filmmaker accepted into his first film festival in New York City in September of 2001. And even just getting into the career was something that was started by a traumatic event. An event that changed the world, an event that changed the focus of my life. So I uh, started making short films. And I made a short film um, called First Flight. I shot it on actual film. It was on 16 millimeter. Have you ever shot film? Uh, super fun because you really don't know how it's gonna turn out until it's, until you get it back. <laughs> Everyone needs a little help now and again, huh? And I ended up going to New York for a film festival. Um, and it played over the same week as 9-11. Uh, so I was in New York, uh, very excited to be starting my film career, um, and then 9-11 happened. Every day, the news media works hard to bring the news of the day into your homes. The tragedies that have become way too often. The men and women of newsrooms all across the country share the emotional impact of horrific events with the world. Can journalists share the trauma without being impacted themselves? What is the true impact for those behind the lens? When I was growing up, I mean, there are photos of me at four years old, carrying around a little play school speaker with a little janky mic on the end. And I'm just running around the house speaking gibberish. And my mom, at that point, said, this, this kid's going to do something where he speaks into a microphone. And she's told that story on and on. And, and I mean, it's remarkable because she kind of knew all along that this is what I'd end up wanting to do, even before I knew I wanted to do it. I had just graduated from high school, and I didn't really know what I wanted to do, but I really thought it was cool, the guy who announced USC football games on radio. And I said, well, yeah, that might be kind of fun. So not knowing anything else better to do, I decided to go into broadcast journalism. And throughout the course of my four years, I went back and forth from being on camera, to being a photographer, to being a newscast director, to being a producer, that would be really cool. Finally, my senior year, my professor said, you graduate in six months, you have to get a job. What are you doing right now? I said, well, I'm doing reporting. She goes, okay, that's what you're gonna do. I guess it was my dad, we, we watched the, uh, he watched the news every night, and I mean every single night, local news uh, here in San Francisco on Channel 7. Now he flip over to watch uh, Walter Cronkite, this is back in the 60s, obviously. And uh, we would watch the news and hit, uh, I mean, that's where we, we, we learned uh, what was going on in the world right there. And so it was my dad watching the news. My, my, uh, my brother said, uh, what do you like to do? 
uh, and I said, well, I like doing, you know, I like doing, a, a, I like radio and I like, you know, the idea of being involved in uh, DJing and news. He goes, well, why don't you do it? So I went to San Francisco State. There was an audition that, uh, that semester for the, the uh, they have a little TV station there. And I auditioned for that, uh, that uh, TV anchor uh, job. And the second I sat down, uh, I knew that that's what I wanted to do. It was, it wasn't radio. It was going to, I really wanted to be on, on TV and, and it, it all kind of made sense. I hadn't put it together with what I was doing when I was a kid watching TV with my dad, but it all kind of made sense all of a sudden. Check one, two, Cooper Rummel, C-O-O-P-E-R-R-U-M-M-E-L-L. It's definitely a voice for radio. <laughs> I'm not even dialed up. Cooper Rummel, KNX 1070 News Radio. I went on a mission trip with my church when I was going, the summer going into my senior year of high school. And we went to India. And it was just such a profound experience. Uh, what I saw was happening over there. Um, the way that the people were being treated. It just, it was an overwhelming experience as a 17 year old. Um, I came back and I had an AP language assignment to talk about what I did over the summer. And this was my chance to kind of sit down and really think about what had happened, um, put it into words. So I wrote this piece and my teacher pulled me aside afterwards and goes, I think you have a real knack for writing. Have you ever thought about journalism or creative nonfiction writing? I said, no, I was planning on being a you know, marine biologist because I like the ocean. That's about it. Um, and so that kind of started me on that path. I don't have one of those good stories. Like, you know how many reporters have those stories where they say that they like, put on newscasts for their families. I was not doing that. Like, I wanted to be a backup dancer. Like, that was my long-term goal. <laughs> and then when my mom was like, we need to find something that's more of a sustainable career, that's kind of how we, like, eventually landed on broadcast journalism. Intern at magazines. This was my first uh, published article. It was a, a travel piece. Uh, newspapers, TV stations, radio stations. Um, my favorite was radio. I was interning at uh, KFYI News out in Arizona. Um, and when I really got the news bug was when there was a shooting at my own apartment complex. Um, I had some friends over and we heard the gunshots just below us. It was directly below. And the news you know, hadn't even arrived. Police were just arriving on scene. I called my dad and said, hey, just in case you hear about this, uh, I'm okay. Um, so if you hear anything on the news, you know, don't worry. He goes, well, you are the news. Shouldn't you get out there? And, you know, meanwhile, I'm just an intern in college. Then I raced to, um, to the KFYI headquarters and I put together a package for the overnight anchor. Again, in turn, I'm not allowed to be on air, but he, he ran it. And then I got called from the news director, uh, Melody Burkett. She's uh, one of my first mentors. And I'm thinking I'm gonna get in trouble for this. And she was just so encouraging. She said, I, I really uh, admire the hustle. That was a great report. And so I started getting assigned stories in the field. There's nobody that I know that like lives, eats, breathes the news like you. Um, so why? How did you get into it? I got in by accident, believe it or not. I, music was my my lifeblood. Go, growing up through high school, played trumpet in the 1984 Olympic Honor Band, then a Tournament of Roses Parade Honor Band, All State College Jazz Band, Marching Band, Concert Band lead trumpet soloist for years and years, played the trumpet for the Air Force for several years. And then when I was stationed overseas and stationed in Charleston, South Carolina, I was also part of the military details where we um, do the funerals for service members and I would play taps at all the funerals. 
just tears you apart. And seeing the family members, and then they talk to you afterwards and stuff. And it's just heartfelt, and then it's just me giving back. And it's always been me giving back, always. And I just felt that was like my strong point. And then when I got out of the military, I you know, didn't know what I was going to do. Rich was like, you know, we're down photographers at our news station. Maybe you might fit in. I mean, it's something you've always done at the home, because I always had the home video cameras. And then I've been doing it ever since, like a kid in a candy store. And I've loved it. And every day I'm telling other people's stories. And that's what the beauty of being in this business is I love telling stories, either by pictures, by sound, or just a collaboration with me and the reporters and putting it all together. It's just an awesome experience. I think everyone remembers exactly where they were on 9-11. And everyone remembers exactly what they were doing and how everyone's world kind of stopped. And I was sitting in the second row of this homeroom class and the TV was on. And we watched the second plane at the tower. And at eighth grade, at 12, 13 years old, I still couldn't comprehend exactly what was happening. And my teacher, who's a 30-year-old guy, was like a cool teacher, drama teacher, tried to get up and try and explain to us what was happening. But I remember not being able to hear or synthesize anything. I just was enamored by what was going on on the screen. And then I remember that a, a reporter got up on the screen and there was ash in their hair and there was ash on their clothes, but they were giving a first-hand account of what they had seen and what, what they were observing from that moment. And that, there was chaos, people running in the streets. And, and I, I just remember in that moment thinking, it is remarkable to me that this man, in the midst of chaos, is speaking with poise and is being able to communicate to the world, even this 12-year-old kid in Albuquerque, New Mexico, what was going on. And as chaotic as that was in that moment, I thought, this is something that I would like to do, to be a calming voice in the midst of chaos, to provide information. I was working in Albany, New York uh, on 9-11. And uh, when it happened, they sent me down, uh, I spent a week down in uh, Manhattan uh, and I was down there with uh, uh, Eric and uh, Dave and uh, the three of us for years. In fact, Dave and I still, every 9-11, we call each other. We don't talk any other time of the year. Every 9-11 we talk. And uh, we talk about Eric. I don't, we don't even know where he went. But uh, he, was, um, he was sitting on the sidewalk uh, next to the live truck on the night of 9-11. And he was just, uh, he was just sitting there just like shaking his head, like uh, he, he was like, like unable to speak. And um, we, were, we were on Staten Island looking right across at the towers and the smoke was still coming up and um, there were all kinds of rumors going around about the terrorists gonna blow up this bridge. And you know, and, uh, we were down there in the river and the, uh, they bring up the uh, 3,000 body bags or 5,000 body bags. and. Uh, it got to him really bad, and um, he stayed. He wanted to go home that night, but uh, he stayed. And maybe he stayed because he felt he had to, and that's not something a your journalist could walk away from. But he, uh, um, there, was, there are some people who have really been stunned to the bone about stories they've seen, um, and Eric was one of them. Uh, but I... I and I remember those images extremely vividly then that entire week. But I think I dealt with it in the sense, I don't know, you just, uh, you've seen tragedy and you're uh, in a sense honored to be able to uh, be the ones who tell an accurate story of what's going on. Really kind of felt like end times. Um, I didn't take a single picture or video which is very unlike me, um, but there are, are visuals that stick with me. It was like every post-apocalyptic movie you've ever seen where it's just a major city that's completely silent. Um, and then groups of people who had to walk from, I was 90 blocks away, 90. 
um, and groups of people had to just walk back to you know where they came from because there's no subways or anything. And you just see like large groups of people, and every once in a while there would be somebody that was covered head to toe in white, you know, uh, dust, or somebody bleeding, or somebody with a bandage, or whatever. But they were sort of like little ghosts, like sprinkled into the rest of the crowd. The panic and the uh, the uh, fighter jets uh, flying low over uh, New York City. Uh, the, the smoke coming up and it never seemed to stop. It was going on and on and uh, you, you couldn't, it was just uh, so hard to imagine. Um, I remember later we uh, took a subway, um, you know, a, a day later or whatever, uh, took a subway and uh, there was a, um, there was a photographer that was coming from uh, Ground Zero. And he had his camera. He was covered in the dust. And he just had this like faraway stare. And that really stuck with me. I wish I had documented some of it. And I think that's part of what drives me to want to document things and want to uh, make sure stories are told. You know, I think journalists decide to do this career because of a greater purpose, something that they really want to make a difference. I started as a sports guy, right? And I never thought I wanted to do news. And I thought that news was a foregone, like that it just wasn't me, right? That wasn't the kid that I had grown up to be. I was a happy kid, wanted to talk about sports and game winners and heroic efforts. And they always say, you don't forget your first body. And, and as morbid and as grotesque as that is, that is the reality. And along those lines, I also remember when I first started a, a reporter in a different station telling me that, listen, once you've seen one, you've seen them all, and you'll kind of start to be desensitized to it. And I remember in that moment thinking, what? How, how could you say that? And I think to a degree that I've kind of made it my mission, so to speak, or part of who I am, that it does bother me. And I don't think I'll ever get used to it because that's somebody's brother, sister, mom, aunt, cousin, wife, best friend. You really firsthand, like a paramedic, police officer, we are right in there with them. We see the stuff that they see, maybe not as close, but there's sometimes, like my very first story by myself that I was sent to was a big rig versus a VW Bug on old Highway 86, and it was a head-on collision. VW Bug had four people in it, and body parts were everywhere. I had no idea that that's what I was coming onto until I was walking onto the crime scene, and the CHP officer told me to stop where I was going, because I was just walking up to go film the accident. And then I looked down, and there's body parts laying all over the, the roadway. And that was the first time it hit me that, wow, Massive um, chain reaction crash, and uh, the cars in the middle caught fire, and nobody could get out. So I, uh, we got there, and uh, in those days it was different. We just uh, walked up, you know, and we're getting shots, and you looked inside, and I remember seeing uh, what was left of a uh, of a of a body in the in this car. That was uh, that's something I think about. I'll never forget that. It was just too stunning. I just uh, kind of shook my head. And it was just, uh, you can't even describe it. The, the, the sight was just amazing. Just uh, to think that that was a human being a few hours ago and now it's just all gone is just uh, stunning. Out of control tanker truck is coming down the hill. The uh, brakes won't work, so the driver bails and it just goes careening down the hill. Couple coming up the hill in their sedan didn't have a chance. Bam. I needed to get to the other side to interview one of the cops. The only way to get to the other side was to walk past a body that was, I don't even need to describe it. You can imagine, I mean, someone ejected after being hit head on by a tanker truck. And I told myself, I know that body's there. 
I am not going to look at it. And I walked all the way past it. I was probably within four feet of it on one side. And I told myself, don't look at it because you're not going to be able to get it out of your mind. And then you become an ineffective storyteller. I can't do my job if I'm an emotional wreck. And so that's why I told myself, don't look at it. And I didn't. I remember it was the tour to Palm Springs and it was an event that happened every year. And we heard that there had been one of the bikers that was hit by a car. And I don't remember the specifics, but I remember I had to go and it was a really remote road. And there was just a body with a, a blanket over it. And, and at that point I had been working in the industry for a while, like a good couple of years. And I remember standing there and the cop was there, maybe some other reporters, and the dead body was just over there. And the rest of us were carrying on conversations, making jokes. And I just remember having a moment being like, whoa, what am I doing? There is a dead person who is sitting right there and I am so oblivious or just like emotionally shut down that I am carrying on a normal conversation while someone has just lost their life. And that was like, a, and that's happened a couple times where I saw myself turning into some person that I didn't recognize and I didn't want that to continue. And I, I, I felt that it would if I continued working in the industry. And that was, that was, that was a hard realization and something I didn't, I didn't like about myself when I, when I realized when that was happening. But to have your, your first like real big story that you covered also be one that personally affected you, it's always hard to have to do both. Like to report a story is one thing, but to report a story that has some sort of personal impact to you. So how did you deal with that just out of the gate? Um, you know, looking back, knowing what I know now, I did what I ended up doing for years in the industry, which was bury it and overwork. Um, I don't think I ever really processed the fact that there was a shooting um, in the apartment right below me. Never thought about stray bullets, you know, what the impact could have been. The fact that the person who was shot was someone who I saw on a daily basis passing through in the, the hallways and um, just kind of jumped into action like we do. The one that really, out of every all my stories throughout my career, was a fire in La Quinta. I forget what year it was, but it was just within the first year, year and a half of me starting. And it was a big apartment complex fire. And I'll never forget it because it was a disabled woman on the second floor. She could not get out. And everybody out there, we could do nothing. And all we could do was just hear the screams. A police officer tries to drive their car so he can get up onto the balcony because he couldn't get, because the fire was everywhere. He couldn't even get in to help her. And then we were all in shock. I mean, just knowing that we know someone died, but yet there's nothing you could have done at the time. And then that, that to me to this day still kind of chokes me. The thing about journalists is they have to go right away all the time. They're getting called out consistently and they never know what they're, they're gonna see. We see in post-traumatic stress disorder, there's an acute reaction, which is some reactions that happen right after being exposed to the incident. And that can settle down in some days or a week or two. If it doesn't settle down, now you're living with this pileup of post-traumatic stress symptoms. It's a fight or flight, so to speak, of you're either gonna curl up into the fetal position or you're gonna do your job and you're gonna go out there and you're gonna do it. Christopher Dorner, the former LAPD officer turned alleged killer. It's been a tragic day for all law enforcement officers across the country. Um, there was uh, a murder, an attempt murder of three law enforcement officers today. And the person responsible for that is still on the street and we don't know what he's going to do. We don't, we know what he's capable of doing. 
and we need to find him. Dorner was my first really big story. So as we're watching, we see this burning truck on the side of Big Bear, and all of a sudden, our GM and our news director said, Tim and Greg, go. So we grabbed whatever stuff we had and whatever warm weather or cold weather clothes we had and got into a car and started booking it. I remember sitting in that car with you and listening to the scanner and listening to news radio and trying to figure out what was going on and then to hear the descriptions of this guy, to recap all the bad things he had already done and that he was running around, so to speak, in this little mountain town and thinking, we're going right into this. On purpose, there were checkpoints of heavily armed police officers that wanted to know why we were going. So they searched our car and they searched us and the, because they couldn't be too careful, right? And that's when I knew we were getting into some serious stuff. But again, despite that fear or apprehension, there was this, I think excitement is a bad word, but a, a certain amount of adrenaline that was pumping at that moment um, of we're going into this and this is important and this is gonna be a huge thing. Long, it was a long drive. It was a long drive. And so we had a lot of time to think about it and a lot of time for my heart to beat out of my shirt. The massive manhunt for a suspected cop killer shifted to the quiet mountain city of Big Bear. San Bernardino Sheriff's deputies found the truck of Christopher Dorner, an ex-member of the LAPD and Navy, burned out on the road between Snow Summit and Bear Mountain Ski Resorts. That drew hundreds of law enforcement officials to the mountain. We were still in Big Bear and he was still on the run. This bad man that had access to a lot of things and training and military training and officer training. And who's to say that he wasn't in our hotel? And I remember that night we're laying in our beds and we only had like three hours to sleep because we had to wake up and do live shots in the morning. And we're hearing this like clanking on the pipes. And it, I guarantee you, was no more than the water heater or the heater to the room because it was freezing and there was snow. But I remember being wide awake and thinking, oh my God, that's him. Like, what? What rational person thinks that's him? But in that moment, after taking my journalist cap off and processing where we were and what we were doing and what was really the danger here, you couldn't help but have a human emotional reaction to this to think, what if that is him? I'll tell you, we just saw a convoy of police cars make their way up the mountain, perhaps to relieve some of the crews that have been working through the night as the snow began. Now, let's take you back to some of the video from yesterday. This search began when they found Mr. Dorner's gray pickup truck uh, on the road between Bear Mountain Resort and Snow Summit Resort. Now, that sent this town into a tizzy. It put schools on lockdown and closed the resort for some time. I mean, as much as we were all saying he could have taken a shot, at, I mean, he would have had to storm out. So it wasn't like he could be picking apart people from the window. But yeah, none of us thought he was going to be right there. Most of us, in fact, thought he was long gone off that mountain. That he was right there. Morning, Jeff. Alex, obviously the big news breaking overnight, as you said, San Bernardino Sheriff's Department confirming they did find human charred remains inside of that burnt out cabin last night. I think it's hard to be scared after the fact because you're not in that moment anymore, right? And you're not at that scene anymore. You don't feel that in the air. And he wasn't targeting journalists. But I think at that point, knowing what he was capable of, yeah, he could have easily picked this off. And I think that's a really crazy thing to think about. And you don't want to think about that when you're out in the field and you're doing that stories. But from that moment on, I kind of thought, yes, there is a serious amount of danger in this job. Fires in general are scary, but I, I don't know why I'm drawn to being right on the front line. Um, those, the, the scariest one I'll never forget, it was the Blue Cup fire. And it was a um, kind of like a ash tornado that hit us. But I didn't see it coming. And then Joe grabbed me and said, jump in the vehicle now. That was scary because it literally ripped off the mirror on the side, broke the window, and had no idea it was even coming until he looked up right at, right at the end of our report. And to me, that was kind of scary. 
we are with the firefighters, paramedics, and police uh, on a daily basis, going to the same scenes. Um, and we're providing a service uh, for the public. We are exposing ourselves to this trauma. We are um, putting ourselves in harm's way to get pertinent information out. I think I'd prefer the term pseudo first responder or secondary first responder, which I know is doesn't really make sense, but <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. so. secondary responder, yeah, yeah. There's so little research right now on this specifically for journalists. There's a lot more on traditional first responders that we can see what the effects are. The journalists have um, a hy uh, hypervigilance in their system. And so they're hypervigilant in the moment if they're still experiencing that level of hypervigilance a week later and thinking about that last incident, there's pro their system's probably having trouble uh, filing it in a place that they can sort of reboot for the next thing. We're such a deadline-oriented business. It's such a process to be able to tell a story, try to put it together in a decent fashion, and get it on air on time and then perhaps move on to another story and get that on the air on time. I become more worried about the process sometimes than the actual um, people. And that's when you know you gotta take a step back. Because I think in the moment you just shut everything off. And then I don't know if that's like the right thing to do, but that's kind of how I dealt with it. You just, you can't let your emotions take over. And so you have to, you are doing a job. And so you have to maintain composure and, and ask the right questions. And so I, I would say maybe it was later that evening, maybe it was the next day, or maybe even it's in hindsight right now when I look back on that moment and I'm like, I don't like that. And now I recognize that maybe that was something that kind of ultimately led to me deciding not to continue on in the industry, I guess. I think in my career, uh, there was only one time it was ever brought up um, by a manager, and it was in Arizona. It was an incredibly, um, it still, it still sticks with me. It was a, a child abuse case that um, it was just shocking, the details. Um, and I was assigned to it. I was 21 and 22 years old and peeling through affidavits and court records and um, It's stuff that I don't even want to repeat, and a lot of it we didn't put on air. Um, and that's the one thing, that's one of the things people don't realize. There's so much that, um, that we see that doesn't even make the air. It bothers me while I'm there, but I separate pretty easily. Um, after about 10 minutes, I mean, it's a job. I, th I think they say that first responders and police sort of develop that way of desensitizing. I don't know if that's the right word, but um, it's, it's rare that I bring stuff home. You know, very similar to traditional first responders, journalists don't usually go home to their families and talk about the gore that they saw that day, because frankly, they don't want to think about it anymore, and their families don't really want to hear about it. So they pretty much just put it away. When people ask me about my days, and I've covered a, a molestation story or a murder, that's not dinner conversation. And that's not something I'm going to voluntarily share, because I want to protect the people that I love from the bad that's going on in the world because I see it firsthand and I cover it firsthand. And so why let it affect more than me and why share that negativity with the people that I love when I know that, again, perhaps ignorance is bliss? You know, 
December 2nd in San Bernardino, I brought that home. Active shooting situation. Uh, authorities 30. looking for the suspects involved. Active no, this is an active shooter incident. Uh, special reports from the network. Now they're heading towards Loma Linda Medical Center. So that's where we're hearing most of the um, yeah, uh, victims are being taken. Being the entertainment reporter, I was thrilled that the day started with me potentially interviewing a red Power Ranger and covering a fun kind of more like lifestyle, fluffy news story. So any day that I got to cover a story like that, I was like, yes. I pulled up to this guy's apartment complex. I got out of the car and I had literally just shaken his hand. And that sounds like such a, you know, cliche line, but it literally happened that way where I shook his hand, I introduced myself, and then my phone rang. Hey, uh, there's there's been a shooting. The person is still at large. There's, I think, I don't even know if someone said there was a lot of people dead, but it, it was a call that I had never gotten before in the sense that they're like, please go into a very active shooting situation. And I'm like, wait, but like, where's my bulletproof vest? Like, I just, I don't, I, I feel like it, my normal human reaction and, and another probably reason why I wanted to cover entertainment news is why many people who love to cover breaking news would be running towards a situation like that. And my instinct is always running away from something like that. But being that I was so close, to San Bernardino, I believe I was in Redlands. It was, there was no other option. Of course I was going. There is a massive media presence here. And as we heard in the press conference, also a massive police response. We got there, right away we knew something was going on because they kept us far away. And then my, my cameraman who is also eyes and ears for me, you know, I'm looking this way, he's looking that way. He says, look at all of these ambulances. And then we stood there on live TV and just counted them. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. And it's, and then we had people coming up to us saying, oh, I'm on the phone with my wife. She's in a room, locked, hiding. There's someone walking around shooting. And just from the massive police response, you see, you start to, um, I think it's, it's, you start to realize what's happening. But the other thing is, and this is important, I think, is to not be overly dramatic while you're standing there. I mean, our job is just to tell the viewer what's happening, what's going on. And, you know, when you're, when you're talking with these people who, you know, on live television about what do they know, and they don't even know if their, their loved ones are gonna be okay or not. Um, you don't need to hype it. And I think by doing that, that helps me, you know, maintain a calm and just realize, hey, we all have a job to do. And I guess what I'm trying to say is I try to not let it in. I try to just stand there as a third person because if, as you know, eventually you are going to be impacted by it, but you don't want to allow yourself to be caught up in that because you can't be a good reporter if you're caught up in the emotion. And I just, I parked my car and I just started looking for people and all these people were gathering around this bridge and I didn't really understand why, but um, I walked up to this man and I was like, hey, do you know what's going on? I, I, I'm, just, I'm just getting on the scene. Do you have any information? Do you, have you heard anything? And it just so happened that he was the dad of someone who was inside who had, the, his daughter had just texted him and said, dad, we're barricading ourselves in this room. Um, I love you. And, and it, he was showing me all these text messages. It was like, you know, I, I believe I remember getting his number and checking in and, and knowing that his daughter did make it out safely, which amazing. But, you know, what could have been last text messages that he exchanged with his daughter. And that was really when, like, the severity of the situation dawned on me, even though it had previously driving over. But, like, speaking to someone who knew someone inside a parent 
it was just it was a really sobering moment i guess and it it felt really personal at that point i felt very badly in that moment because you know you were all alone out there and i tried so hard to get to you and it was and i was just being blocked oh, like yeah. like everywhere i i went i was being blocked and i remember like telling rich you know i'm like listen i'm on one side of the street she's on the other side and they will not like let me cross the street let's go let's go let's go isn't that so weird how in those moments like simple things like crossing the street where no one is ever blocking your ability to walk across the road in any other situation and then when you have a moment like that where you can see another person you know you're on the other side of the street i'm on the other and we're so close and we just were not allowed to get to each other and i have no idea how we worked around that but we eventually did uh link up which it was so nice to have you there with me and and that again like i don't think i could have done that alone and and probably what i would have done if no one else came i would have maybe befriended some of the other tv station people and like had them adopt me but um I, it was so nice to just feel like you had kind of like that backup and and felt like you had someone to kind of like bounce ideas off of or like strategize in that way and so i do remember as soon as you came as soon as i had a photographer or, or anyone like i don't even care anyone as soon as i had a buddy it felt like i had um a team it felt like i had backup and and that's kind of in those situations that's probably one of the most important things that you need i would say that i became closer with my um my competitors than my my colleagues not to say i didn't develop relationships with my colleagues but yeah you are as a radio reporter being sent out into the field alone spending eight ten twelve hours a day um that these horrific scenes and you want to latch on to people you want to you need that smile in another person to lift your spirit somehow and um so yeah but there's not a lot of processing with um with your competitors i mean it, it is just that friendly smile which is a reminder that i personally am okay i'm not um involved in this tragedy but yeah it's really i never thought about that the fact that um you know on a television side there are teams being sent out and i know it is moving more towards the multimedia journalist one-man band but yeah you're spending all day alone and um you could be driving from one traumatic scene to the next um and all you have are your thoughts uh swirling about what you just left and prepping for what you're about to go to i felt that the relationship with all of the photographers that i worked with was you just kind of feel like someone else has your back or just the shared experience of going through something together I think you feel as if you're more comfortable sharing how you're feeling. You're more comfortable having that conversation and understanding that the way you might be feeling is not abnormal, that that other person is probably feeling that way as well. So it's it was a, a, a massive difference working with a photographer than doing it all on your own. Then you come home and that's all you've been talking about is you know what's happening and then you flip on the tv and that's all anyone's talking about and at the same time you feel like you can't really talk about anything else and that's when it 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 kind of hit me um and so i brought that home i mean the chaos and the sadness and not only that day not only that specific day and knowing how much death was present in that place but the days that followed in talking to victims, families, and hearing the stories and hearing the just bitter sadness that this one event changed and impacted the lives of so many people. It was one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. But when people are experiencing a thought when they don't want to about the incident or a smell might trigger something that reminded them of it, um, they can be triggered and sort of relive the event over and over. And that becomes exhausting. It can disrupt sleep. And um, journalists in particular, similar to first responders, there's a cultural stigma that you don't talk about 
how bad you felt about that incident because it might affect your job. Somebody might think you're weak or it might get to the higher ups and they say, well, maybe they can't handle it. So there's this sort of suffering in silence that people don't want to talk about how awful something was that they saw, even though that would help. The, uh, in the culture, in media, you don't talk about it. And it wasn't until later that night when I finally looked and took out my personal cell phone and I had 30 text messages and emails from people all over the country that said, oh my gosh, I just saw you on world news with all these police cars flying behind you. <laughs> of this crazy terrorist attack. And in that moment, I kind of said, that was the biggest thing I've ever covered. And on the same coin, the the most horrific tragedy that I've ever covered. And horrific tragedy are both things that I try not to say in news because they're used so much. And so it's gotta be something really bad for me to call something a tragedy. And this was a tragedy. These are people that did not need to die, that should not have been killed. And that's when it kind of hit me that, wow, we were just in the heart of that. It confirmed that, like, yeah, Allie, this is this ain't for you. Like, you are not equipped to handle this. And and I don't think that's anything bad against me. I just think that there's some people who can handle that sort of thing, and I definitely could not. But again, I think that that's also a hindsight sort of situation because in the moment when we were covering it, I think it happened on a Wednesday. So it was Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then Saturday was the first day that. I wasn't going to cover the scene. And so I think at that point is when I really, really realized and it dawned on me, oh my God, I, I can't continue doing stuff like this. But in the moment, those three days, again, you're just, your adrenaline is so high. You're not even thinking about anything other than just kind of like keeping it moving. Let's just get through the day. Uh you're basically some of the people in the other end of that uh, television or radio or wherever it is you're where however it is you're broadcasting they're saying well what happened and you're the one who has to tell them and you you it's so hard to do sometimes but you got to tell them what happened without you know your opinion of here's what i here's, here's the way i see it because they're not really asking you how it is you saw it because you're not elected anything you're just a you're, you're a person who is who's out there to 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 tell them what happened and they're asking what happened so get out there and, and, and be good and, and tell them. I think one of the problems with journalists is there, ha to my knowledge, there hasn't been much training in the career about the effects of being exposed to traumatic stress and human suffering. There's not a lot of training, so you, people don't know what to look for. And people don't know that, oh my gosh, you know, I haven't slept well in the last month. Um, that might mean something. And so people don't understand the cumulative effect and that maybe they could use some assistance. When you, when you finish that day, can you just go home and lay down and go to sleep? <laughs> no, I, a lot of the most tiring days are the days that um, you end up, and the days where you only know you have four hours to sleep before you have to be back at it you'll go home and you'll pace and you'll look at your Twitter feed and you'll look at the coverage and you'll, you'll just stay on it and you stay in that amped up uh, zone because you know you're probably gonna be back out there the next day and why would you let yourself calm down? Um, I think that's uh, probably how, at least for me, it developed into ins insomnia um, and night terrors, um, which we could get into as well. Um, but even on the days where it wasn't that super big adrenaline rush or anything majorly traumatic that you're covering, um, you know, you ask my housemates and they'll tell you I've woken them up countless times screaming in the middle of the night, um, you know, through 
uh, therapy and just stepping away from news and um, through my faith, um, you know, I found healing from that. And um, thankfully, I'm not in that place anymore. But yeah, there was about a year where every night I was waking up multiple times out of just in in panic. Um, and I think again, it's one. It's probably a couple of things going on. That adrenaline is always there. You've got a low level anxiety because you're exposed to all this and you just haven't processed what you're seeing. Sometimes it takes a few hours. I mean, when you finally get home and so I would end up playing video games for a couple hours or I mean, normally you would probably go to bed early because you're exhausted or whatever. But if you're still on that, that adrenaline rush, you could go for a few hours into the night either you know just watching something to calm yourself or go to the gym for a workout for another hour just to kind of you know get your body tired in some other way or keep your mind off something else just to bring you down but yeah the adrenaline rush sometimes when you get onto a scene because everything's happening right then and there and then we're trying to get information back to the station we're trying to find information we're trying to calculate everything that's going on on the scene and then you're, you're, everything in your body is just moving, moving, moving fast, fast, fast. And yeah, the adrenaline rush can really get you going. And then finally, when it stops, you just crash. And then either go to sleep or you're just at complete drain. I, I do feel sometimes at the end, when your body finally, it's just, it's, it's enough. And it just kind of like just crashes right there. <sighs> I mean, I think that everyone deals with it in their own way, right? And I once, I don't know if we talked about this, but I once had someone say to me, who's not in the business, who said to me, so I hear that all of you are alcoholics. And I just thought, I mean, what? Although it might make them feel a little bit better in the moment, it doesn't solve the problem, but it does let off the steam. And so there becomes this coping strategy of I'll feel better after a couple of drinks. And then I don't have to think about what's popping up in my mind or the physical reactions of all the adrenaline and the cortisol that's been pumped into the system. I'm sure everyone probably drinks too much. I think, <laughs> I think it's sometimes, it, that was never my go-to. If anything, probably I'd just order a pizza. So that's my negative coping strategy. That, you know, that really seemed to be uh, the case early in my career uh, for me and for everyone else. But... I think it was because when you're just starting out, you're you're in a, a low paid job with a lot of young people who just got out of college, young and single, and would go out after work and we would drink. I don't know if it had to do with the job or if it was just like such an exciting, we felt so full of ourselves, I think. I mean, in a way, how how great this is and we're doing what we always wanted to do and uh, we'd go out and would drink. Uh, as time goes by, you get the, 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 the level of people you're working with are little bit older and they're a little bit more settled so i don't i don't know uh i don't know about uh, alcohol and uh coping uh, i personally would was drinking before during uh and after i started uh, this this career and uh i've since stopped but um at, right now i'm at a at a station where everybody's married or in relationships and uh there's no nightlife there's no nightlife at all but yeah i mean different people deal with the pain and the sadness and the emotions in different ways and maybe for some it's alcohol and i've tried to promise myself for that very reason not to drink because of work because i think that's detrimental and you know people work out or people share with their families but even sharing with your loved ones i mean i think that can be very taxing on the people that you love and that you care about because they have to hear about all these terrible things firsthand over and over and they're not built for that. I mean, nobody's built for that. But I think everyone deals with it in their own way. And I think if you don't talk about it and you're just the tough guy, and, and, and I think to a degree I am still this, that it's just part of what I do, it's my job. But then I can feel in myself when I cover several of these things back to back to back that it starts to wear on me. And I start to become irritable. And I start to come to a place where I feel like I'm seeing so much bad in the world that I start to become negative. 
It's funny because you're right. There is this stereotype of the uh, the jaded alcoholic reporter, and um, you kind of see it all over. Um, it's laugh so you don't cry, and um, you know, numbing the pain. And yeah, I certainly have seen that in the industry, and um, yeah, it's uh, I I don't drink. Uh, anymore, I'm I'm sober, and I think there's certainly, um, looking back, certainly times in news where that was something that was uh, easy to turn to, and um, yeah, it's just um, it's too bad that they're not. People talk about that, but they don't talk about healthy ways to process, right? Some of the helpful coping strategies that uh, journalists exhibit are getting together and um, sort of having that organic peer support, whether you know it or not. As a team, you would talk to each other and, you know, but not really go into deep what each other's emotions, I guess, are about you. It kind of, all of us kind of just hold it in and either you take it out at home or cry or you know, you, there really is no level of just going, at least in my experience, I haven't really ever in-depth discussed feelings. Just like first responders who maybe are slow to admit that they need help, if somebody doesn't realize they need help, what would be, what would be, some, of the, what would be some of the signs? What would be some of the things that are happening in their life that maybe would? Well, when, if a loved one says, you seem different, or are you okay? Um, ask them what are they noticing? Irritability, sleep problems. Sometimes people are having nightmares where the system is trying to, you know, file the data during the night and they're actually woken up with a startle. Um, appetite changes or even, a, we call it a little bit of the Tasmanian devil, maybe getting really busy or taking on a lot of extra assignments just to stay busy because the system's on overload and there's some discomfort. The, the better coping strategies are making sure you're working out and drinking a lot of water and um, perhaps even keeping a journal yourself about what you're going through and what you're seeing. Because being able to get it out means that you're not storing it in. And I would say that I deal with things a lot better than I did 17 years ago because I'm, I just focus more on the process and don't allow my emotions to get into the story. Just report what you see, report what you hear. These are the facts as we know, know them and don't get emotional about it. It's a lot easier now than it was then. But working with Tim and, and Bobby, who'd been in this thing forever, they started to say, that as they were approaching retirement, they've done it so much, but it's starting to hit them more. I don't think you could be a reporter and get involved in every every story you do. You'd, you'd lose your mind. You'd, you'd just flat out lose your mind because that's every day you go in, and whatever story you're on, if there's a triple homicide, you're being shifted to that story. And if you start really thinking about three people are dead, and there's husbands and wives and children and mothers and fathers and grandfathers, and, relatives all involved, their hearts are all broken, and you really tune into that, I don't know how you're gonna tell that story. Eventually, all of those shootings, all of those door knocks, all start to add up. And you don't know when that's gonna be. You know, cynicism and sort of this detached sense of things at times is fine. It's something that is necessary for journalists to do to be able to cope with the repeated exposure and the chronic um, exposure to human suffering. And yet, if you begin to see that that sort of starts to generalize in the rest of your life, that's not a good thing. If you are unable to either enjoy or feel some pain when a family member's upset, if, if you really feel that sort of closed down, unable to access what would be a normal reaction in your life, um, to a normal thing that's happening, that's when somebody's probably in trouble because they've shut down and detached too far. And that means that the pileup is probably rising. And so the need to detach 
is also um, increasing. So if there's not that, you know, if you can detach from work things, okay. But if you're detaching from normal human expression in your regular life, that's not okay. I, I try to keep myself, you know, in my own little fantasy bubble world sometimes where I don't even really like to go into things like that. You know, I try to avoid, I guess you could say I do avoid those kinds of incidences as much as I can. People, when it comes to um, like a murder in your hometown or something like that, it's all people can talk about. And to you, it's just, okay, it's another, it's another story. It's sad, but um, yeah, it it just doesn't lose that umph, and you kind of feel a little crazy because you see how it's impacting people. Um, and you're wondering why is this not impacting me in that way? When a journalist loses that sense of purpose, or when the what they've seen changes their worldview into a negative, bitter, you know, cynical sense, that's when they're in trouble. Would you call your would you call yourself desensitized? One thousand percent. Absolutely. Like I remember when the Vegas shooting happened, I felt nothing. And that's not that was not me prior to working in the news. Like I just remember feeling so numb. I remember talking to friends who were so torn up acting how they should have acted and I was just like, yeah, sad. And when do you know if you need help? I mean, a lot of times you might really be struggling with something, but you may not even know it. It might not just be an issue of, I don't want to ask. It might be an issue of, man, this is really affecting me. And I don't know it. I remember my boss saying when we got back, take the time that you need. This is all brand new, and this is nothing that we thought you would see or that really we wanted you to see. And he said, if you need to talk to us, talk to us. If you need to talk to a counselor, talk to a counselor. And I remember thinking, what, how, why would I need to do that? And I got home, and who do you call? Call your mom. I called my mom and I'm crying on the phone. She's like, oh my God, what happened? And I told her and, and she's like, I, is this still what you want to be doing? And I said, mom, in some crazy way, I think yes. In fact, it's an emphatic yes. This is how we are first responders. If, if you had, if you had a, a, a firefighter, who a paramedic who was going to show up and saw someone there all shot up and just couldn't handle it and not a single paramedic there could handle it because they were all too emotional about it, what good are they? They have jobs to do. They need to get beyond that. And I think we have jobs to do. And so we need to desensitize to deal with it and to be effective reporters. I mean, you're always running out after house fires. You're not, not sure what you're going to see there. Uh, homicides, uh, you know what you're going to see there, but you don't know how bad it's going to be. Uh, you develop an insensitivity to it. And uh, it's not that you can't tell the story, because you can, but you also, you can tell the story without breaking down and becoming, uh, I think a lot of people, when I tell people things that I've seen, they find it, they find it very upsetting just to hear about it. But after a while, you get you get used to it in a sense, and it, it does enable you to to tell a story rationally. I think, um, although some would say, how could you possibly look at a look at a a, a a dead body and and not have a just be shuddering? But after after a while, you don't. You it is an, is an incident that happened, it's as insensitive as that might sound. They have to go sort of against human nature of wanting to go in and help. And so when my fire chief said, remember, it's not your emergency, that helped me remember 
Although I'm responsible for my job and what I'm doing, I'm not responsible for how it turns out. And um, just knowing that you can do the best you can do, and it still, still may not be popular, the clip that's shown people still may get upset about, and um, that you still may not be wanted on the next incident, um, but that you're doing the best that you can do with the job that you've signed up for. You're right up against all these different other TV stations. And so you start to chat with people and you start to get to know them. And I remember seeing other reporters pulling out their lawn chairs, sitting down, you know, going back to the coping mechanisms of cracking jokes, laughing. And again, as someone pretty new to the industry, I remember just being kind of like horrified at the moment. And I was like, oh my God, don't they know this is, such a terrible thing that just happened and of course everyone has their coping mechanisms um and i i think we made friends with um some reporters from telemundo who i actually still talk to this day so it's so funny how in strange you know situations friendships form but i remember them asking us like hey guys we're gonna order some pizza like you guys want some pizza and i'm like what i mean yes i want pizza like i would love some pizza i haven't had food in like eight hours but i'm like but we're at a terrorist attack like this just happened and we're ordering pizza i just my mind was blown in the moment and of course you have to eat like what am i supposed to do be a, a martyr for the situation of course not but it was just one of those eye-opening moments when i realized all of these people around me were network news reporters. This is their daily life. Like after this, after this story's done, they're going to a hurricane. After that, they're going to a horrific, you know, murder. After that, they're going to an earthquake. And it's just one really hard situation after another. And so who am I to complain about how I felt in the situation? I mean, I can't even begin to imagine what these people feel like on a day-to-day -day basis being confronted by tragedy, heartache, horrible situations. I mean, the, people talk about like clothing allowances in TV, like those network news anchors or reporters or whoever, they need an on-call therapist, like someone they can call up right away because I just can't, I can't imagine how they deal with that the public um, does not realize what we do. And um, I think there are some misconceptions that it is a, um, that it's a cush job or that it's um, a glamorous job. I used to like to say it's the most blue co collar, white collar job there is um, because it's a grind um, and it's a lot of hard work and it's not just being a pretty face or a good voice. Um, it is book smarts and it is street smarts and it is hustle um, and grit. But what we're learning is that debriefings and being able to have peer support, maybe having a senior journalist come and talk to a junior journalist say, yeah, that was pretty gnarly, wasn't it? just to give it some normalcy, to normalize this job that you do that's very unique. Not many people are called upon to show up at the scene, film it closely, and then not talk about it, as if it didn't affect the human that's behind the camera. With as much bad stuff as journalists see in day in, day out, and this isn't just reporters, this is photographers and editors, and writers and producers, this is everyone in our business. For the sake of their mental health and the, for the sake of their well-being, I think it's something that needs to be addressed. But again, it goes back to us being able to stand up and say, hey, this is bugging me. And hey, I don't think I'm mentally there right now. And that's something really hard to do. I, I tell you that I, it's not something that I'm comfortable with asking for help and saying, yeah, I've got a lot of bad stuff going on. But I think ultimately, if you don't, and I've only been in it for eight years and I wanna be in it for 50, I think that it eats at you. And I think in order to remain healthy and to have any sort of life work balance, it's something that needs to be addressed across the board.
I think people forget that journalists and reporters and anchors are, are human beings with feelings. Um, I've had death threats. I've had, um, you know, people just question my character, people, uh, the name calling, the profanity, uh, laced emails and tweets at me. Um, and there's just such a lack of empathy and understanding that this, this person loves what they do and they're just trying to do it for you. I just didn't want it hanging on the wall as a reminder, but it is still pretty cool. This is, I got this from my grandfather, Washington Post, uh, Nixon resigns, um, you know, and articles by Carl Bernstein and Bob Woodward. And um, this is an authentic Washington Post, a newsboy apron um, from just a couple of years after this. They do it because they love it and they think it's important. They look to the First Amendment and freedom of the press, and they know that there's a reason why our founders, um, you know, it was so crucial to our democracy. Um, and that fire still burns within me. And that, again, is a similarity with other first responders. They're not coming in just to upset people. They are the least popular first on scene. So the cops don't like us, and the protesters, uh, you kind of just uh, have to stop and uh, really, uh, you know, take stock. What what exactly are you doing there? You know, what what is it? What is the point of you being there where nobody wants you to be there? Um, and that that is because the viewers do want you to be there. You go home and you can feel fine. And if nobody likes you, nobody likes you. But that is your job. Last two years have been. I've seen the biggest increase against the media. I've had. I can't even count how many now but it's been several one night i was out on a live shot and some guy parked right behind us looked like he was a meth addict of some sort could not tell and we were in our car at the time but i was just kind of monitoring as to why because we were no one else should have been there and kind of watching he looked kind of weird to me so i told my reporter let's go drive to another location real quick and then maybe come back because we still had a half hour till our live shot and then he started following us, which really alerted me as to why is this guy now? So something is possibly up. Eventually we lost him and he went on his way or whatever, but could not tell. Then I had another incident where me and another reporter were out and then someone came up and threw black paint on us or yeah, black paint. Yeah, but at the moment, you didn't at the what, moment that, right? what I saw out of my eye was when his arm goes up like this, I thought it was a gun. I thought it was. I thought my day was over. I had no idea what it was till I finally realized it was some kind of liquid being thrown at me, which I had no idea what kind of liquid it was. I was able to get out of the way in time, but it got all over the car. And but that to me, that day, I thought I was dead. But we're out there doing a public service to everyone, and they don't. People, for some reason, really don't see us that way. Uh. There was a demonstration in Oakland. Uh, the marchers were leaving the city hall and heading down to the police department. My photographer decided to, we, we talked about it, he, he was gonna stay with the marchers and get them walking down the street, but I had to get the live van down to the police department. So I got into the live van by myself. I was driving there and uh, right in front of me, there's a van pulled over and two people are being taken out of the van. So I just, it was in my lane. I didn't have to change lanes. I, put, I stopped the truck, put it in park, put the camera up on my steering wheel, and I start rolling. And uh, it's it's the dream come true. I mean, it's the easiest story I've ever seen. And all of a sudden, I hear a pounding on my uh, hood. I'm going to arrest you. I don't care if you're with the media. Turn around and go that way. What's your name? Dr. Officer Brown. And with that, he says, get out of the car. So that's where the recording stopped. But what I got, happened is I got out of the car. He took my phone, he handcuffed me, handed me over to another, another officer and said, walk him up the street. So they walked me up to the corner. I was there for 10 minutes in handcuffs and another five minutes after they took off the handcuffs and then they let me go back to the truck and proceed. And I always tell people that this is not a job and this is not a career, this is a calling. Because you gotta wanna do this.
my shift uh, changed after one of my colleagues was um, let go. And it was right before Christmas. And I got a text that said, so now you're working Christmas. And I said, well, I, you know, I have plans with my family and tradition. And as a Christian, you know, Christmas is also very important religious holiday aside from the family aspect. And I tried to explain this to my news director and the text that I got back was, um, your family and your plans come second. The sooner you get this, the better off we'll all be. During the wildflower bloom, I just wanted to have a day with my mom um, to take her to go see the wildflowers. And it was on a day off, and, um, which a day off for me was a Tuesday, um, right? Because we all work odd hours and days. And I was just so excited about getting down there and we're on our way. And this is when the um, college admission scandal broke. And I got a call, sorry, we need you. And I, you know, I don't know, I, I probably sounded like a broken record to, to my bosses saying, you know, I'm, I, I have plans. I'm, I'm with my mom about to go see the wildflowers, just a little peace, a little break from, um, it's funny, it makes me, makes me a little emotional thinking about this one because it just, it was just gonna be a special, a special day, a little break from the craziness. Um, and you, you don't get it, you know? Said, turn around, drop your mom off, come back, get the news truck, and go if you wanna have a job. If some people are struggling, I mean, I've seen people that are really good reporters. After a couple of years, they leave the business. They're really good at what they do, but because of the mental, I guess, behind the scenes, they, they decide to get out of it. It's just way too much. If, I'm, if I think back to when it probably started to go downhill in a um, very tangible, palpable way was um, the Ridgecrest earthquakes. Um, happened right before I went on vacation. Um, and I, I got out to Ridgecrest shortly after the first big earthquake. Um, and I think from what I counted, I was there for a total of like 300 after, like uh, major aftershocks that you could feel. So the earth is shaking beneath you constantly. That's very unsettling. I, I worked a very long shift. I, I drove home. I, uh, I spent a couple hours packing and then I hopped on a, a flight to Hawaii. And um, it took me about three days to stop looking at my phone um, and to stop monitoring what was happening. Because again, that adrenaline, um, there's something about it. Um, and this need to, to be on just because you're always on call. You're not used to, I feel like vacations feel so foreign. It takes, it takes the amount of a vacation to get yourself into vacation mode. And when I came back, everything changed and um, my mental health deteriorated quickly. I found myself in a very depressed state. Um, I found myself being impacted a lot more by the trauma that we're seeing. I had made a commitment to the TV station and I was gonna fulfill that. So I think it was more so just making the decision that after my contract was up, I was going to look for a different sort of job. Um, but I would say, I would say within the months after San Bernardino, I pretty much knew that I didn't want to continue putting myself in situations where that type of news story could happen again. It just, I didn't feel like I was put on this earth to cover stories like that. And, and there are people who are put on this earth to handle those horrible situations, to tell the stories. And I think it's, you know, I don't want to sound as if I don't think journalists or, or reporters are 
not important. I think they're probably one of the most important jobs if, you know, if, if, if we think about the current situation that we're in right now with the pandemic and the current state of the world, I think that journalists and reporters are so, so, so important. But I think you also have to look, have a really hard look at yourself and, and decide whether you are the right person for that job. And I don't, I don't think that I was. I, I got into the newsroom and I was handed a stack of assignments. Um, the first was a violent um, breaking and entering robbery in Irvine. Uh, the second was a uh, alleged cop killer who was on the loose, possibly in the in Southern California area. Um, the third was a court case for a child abuse, molestation. Um, and then, oh, hey, by the way, uh, we know you're usually off at eight, but instead, you're gonna drive up the coast and cover a vigil. You're, you're gonna be there, you're gonna put together uh, packages, you're gonna do this many live shots, put together this many packages uh, for the overnights and for the morning and uh, drive back, which put me getting home at likely 3 or 4 a.m. Um, and probably three or four hours of sleep if, if I was able to. And something happened. Um, and I grabbed my, I just, I felt almost frozen. I grabbed my assignments and I went to a studio and I shut the door and um, I just broke down. I just started weeping. Um, I can remember sitting there holding the, uh, holding the stack of assignments and just, I couldn't do it. I just couldn't tell another bad story. I just couldn't see another bad thing. So, I went into my news director's office and I just told her I couldn't do it. But also I, I remember her distinctly saying, maybe this industry isn't for you. As if being human was uh, was not okay to be just, you you're either a human or you're a journalist. The best thing I could say is you got to talk about it. You got to have you got to talk it out. You got to let it go. Um, because the longer you hold on to that, you know, without getting the proper help or without, you know, dealing with it, um, it just festers. I'm currently working as a freelance show host, I guess you would call me. I'm still working out what the hell my title is because I don't know, I struggle with that. It was so easy to say I was a TV news reporter that like got people's attention just like that. But um, I, I, I create videos for tourism boards, hotels, companies, brands, and kind of work as the on-camera talent. I mean, I would have never predicted that I'd be where I am right now, but I can say with the most certainty I've ever had in my life that every single day when I wake up, I am so happy, I am so fulfilled, I am so feeling like that for the first time, I'm doing exactly what I need to be doing. And that is like, oh, it's the best feeling ever. I started, um, again, just the, the healing during that time um, was through faith and through therapy. And, um, I started volunteering at uh, my church uh, for their marketing and communications team. Um, started doing that at a number of different churches um, and volunteering turned into contract work. And they're really, um, I found was there's a need for someone with a journalistic skill set um, to find stories of hope and redemption 
and um, faith and love. I love being a photographer. I love telling stories. So a lot of them are sad. I'm helping to either help ease the pain of the family, um, helping to show that, you know, we are good in the community and we are here to help them in any time of need as well. And so I like to get those stories out, even the bad and the good, they equal out. And um, it's just one of those things that I've always, I keep going. I mean, I just love doing it. It's, I don't know what else to say, but it's just a passion that I have always had to try and tell the stories the best I can. I think journalism is a truly noble profession. I mean, I asked if I was the first, thought I was in the level of first responder. I'm not at that level, but I do something that is, uh, I'm not a first responder, but I'm doing something that is incredibly necessary uh, in a democracy. It's a, it's so noble if you do it right. And I'm not, I can't say I'm, you know, I'm not saying I'm noble and I always do it right, but I do try. There's uh, standards, uh, follow them. Uh, you don't like it sometimes. Um, it's just a, it's just absolutely positively the media is, the press is necessary. Uh, in uh, for this for this country to go on, because people have to know what's going on uh, in order to uh, in order for this democracy to continue. I just think that journalists are so important, and I just really admire the people who can do this day in and day out. And I think that we're seeing such value in people who are really digging for the truth and at sometimes putting their lives and their personal lives at great risk in order to get to the bottom of a story and to get to the truth of something. And so I think that it, while it is extremely difficult and while there are so many sacrifices that you need to make as a journalist, I think in the end, it really is worth it. Maybe not even for you, but maybe for the people that you help by sharing that story. Um, so I just want, I want to make that abundantly clear, even though I couldn't, I couldn't stay the course. I just, I really admire people who can, because it's not easy. People who work hard to bring you the stories of the day, sometimes at great risk to themselves, whether it be a terrorist attack, a mass shooting, a global pandemic, or whatever the story of the day may be, whether the impact is large or small, the emotional impact might be huge. To the journalists out there, take care of yourself. You can't tell your stories and share your vision unless you take care of your emotional well-being as well. No matter what the story might be, journalists will be there to share it with you at home because that is life behind the lens.